All right, let's take our Bibles and open to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah 9, as we continue our study through one of the really important scriptures that give us some tremendous insight of prophecy about the Messiah in some of the details of the Old Testament that are just simply amazing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that just blesses our soul. And God, we just turn our heart to you and pray that by your spirit, you just absolutely take hold of us and transform us. God, thank you for your heart after us. You pursue us. And you draw us to yourself. And I pray that tonight that's exactly what would happen. Lord, by your spirit, you would just pursue relationship and cause revival to happen tonight in us as we see your heart after us in the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Context, just as a reminder, uh, this is taking place after uh, Jerusalem was defeated by Babylon. They were held in exile for those 70 years. Babylon eventually was defeated by the Medes and Persians, and Cyrus the king let them go back. Let the Jews go back. Rebuild your temple. Rebuild the city. Only 50,000 went back, and man, were they discouraged. They came back to an absolute mountainous heap of rubble, and just one trouble after the other. At first, you know, they were encouraged, but then one challenge, one problem, the Samaritan people from the north offered to help, and they turned that down, and so they brought trouble against them by writing letters to the, the then current king, and they ordered the work to stop, and they got discouraged, and their faith began to be faltered, and so what did God do? He sent the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to encourage them, rise up and build. God has called you to build this temple. And the temple represented the presence of God in the midst of his people. I want this temple to be rebuilt, but they're all discouraged. And uh, the famous uh, Zechariah uh, chapter 4 where he says, Do you see what this vision is, Zechariah? He says, No, what is it? And it was an image of a lampstand with seven lamps and a bowl in the middle that fed them. But there were two olive trees and these branches that fed that. What is this? This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, the governor. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O gray mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. This is the work of the Lord. In other words, this is not your strength. This is not your might. See, that's the problem here, Zechariah. You're looking at this from the perspective of your understanding. You're looking at this from the perspective of your small nature and your small stature. And that's why your faith is faltering. He sends sends the word, he sends the prophet to strengthen them, to arise in their faith. Because God is greater than this, this mountainous heap of rubble. God's bigger than that. I will... Accomplish it by the sending of my Holy Spirit. He will accomplish what concerns me. And there's that faith that arises. Now, he sends it to us. I'm convinced our faith needs to arise. Our faith needs to be strengthened. We need to draw near to the Lord. We have mountainous problems. We understand. But what we do need to see is that God wants us to rely on him. And the word that he gives in the prophecy is really interesting because he shows them that there's a bigger picture here. God's bigger, and even your little myopic view of things is only a small image. God's doing something far greater, and he reveals it to them. He shows them the coming Messiah and many aspects of the coming Messiah, whom we know, of course, is Jesus, Jesus, Joshua. He is the one who is the promised Messiah, but he gives descriptions and interesting details like you see in no other book. And it really connects many prophecies together of Scripture. Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, Revelation. It all comes together in this book. And it really is fascinating. So we kind of pick it up right in the middle of this book. In chapter 9, where he's going to give prophecies uh, against the nations nearby. But it connects to Israel, as we're going to see. The burden 
or the oracle of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach, this is Syria, up in the north, with Damascus as its resting place, for the eyes of men, especially of all the tribes of Israel, are toward the Lord. In other words, that's the only place you're going to get help. So he goes on. And Hamath also, which borders on it. Specifically, these cities of Tyrus or Tyre and Sidon. They were kind of twin cities up along the coast. If you go to uh, the Mediterranean Sea, right there uh, off, off of Israel, and go north, uh, this would be the area where Tyre or Tyrus and Sidon would be found. And they, at this point, uh, Tyre in particular, was like a major uh, center of commerce. They had a fleet of ships, and it made them extremely wealthy. I mean, they, well, it describes it. Uh, and Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise, in other words, because you think you are very wise, for Tyre has built herself a fortress, and she's piled up silver like dust, and she's piled up gold like mire of the streets. That's how much wealth they have accumulated. Behold, the Lord will dispossess her and cast her wealth into the sea. Interesting prophecy. Now, of course, we have the advantage because we have other prophecies of Isaiah, for example, that gave specific prophecies that the city itself would be thrown into the sea and that fishermen would dry their nets there. That is just, uh, how can a city be thrown into the sea? I mean, it's almost like too much to imagine. I mean, come on, how can a city be thrown into the sea? But that's interesting because that's exactly what happens. And he goes on to describe, Behold, the Lord will cast her wealth into the sea, and she will be consumed with fire. So just a little bit of history. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, the famous Nebuchadnezzar that, that destroyed Jerusalem, he went against Tyre and besieged it. But... Uh, the besiegement didn't really work all that well when it's a port city and they got a fleet of ships. And they just provide, they just had all the provision. There was a huge underground spring. And for 13 years, that's a long besieging. For 13 years they besieged that city and could not succeed at it because what happened was they, there was an island about a mile or so off of the coast. And so during the 13 years, they just started moving everything over to the fortress island. And it was like impregnable because there was like these huge 150-foot cliffs, and they built the fortress on top of that. I mean, just impregnable. So they just kept moving all the wealth over to the, uh, to the island city. And so when Nebuchadnezzar finally broke into the city, there wasn't anybody there. All the silver, the gold, all the valuables, everything, they're all living out there on the fortress. And he was frustrated by this. But Alexander the Great came. And, and he mentions Alexander the Great in aspects down a few verses here. And so Alexander the Great comes. And uh, he, of course, demands that they capitulate and give in to him. They, they refuse to do. Look, we withstood Nebuchadnezzar for 13 years. We're not going to give in to you. And so uh, what he did, he had his soldiers just take the city that remained uh, deserted on the mainland. He just had him take the city and throw it into the sea and make a causeway out to the fortress. And then he just marched his men right out to the fortress and destroyed it and burned it to the ground. Interesting prophecy in great detail. But it continues. He will cast your wealth into the sea. She will be consumed with fire. Next verse 5. Ashkelon. This is, this is the city... Down in the southern part of the coast, this is where the Philistines had their cities. Ashkelon will see it and be afraid. Gaza too will rise in pain. So where is the Gaza Strip? If you know a little geography, it's on the coast in the south. That's, of course, where many of the Palestinian refugees are today. And that is a huge aspect of what's happening politically in the world today this Palestinian problem. By the way, the modern word Palestinian does not relate to the ancient Philistine people. It's the same name. It's not the same people. The reason why it's the same name is that when Rome finally destroyed it, uh, at some point they decided to rename it, not wanting to call it Israel. 
wanting to insult the Jewish people by naming it after their mortal enemies, the Philistines. So they called it Palestine after the Philistines, but there are no Palestinian people left. And it kind of describes that here. Ashkelon will see it and be afraid. Gaza too will writhe in great pain. And Ekron, in the most northern part of that area, for her expectation has been confounded. Her expectation was that uh, Tyre would be able to withstand the Alexandrian forces, but of course they could not, and therefore her expectation was confounded. Moreover, the king will perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon will not be inhabited. They will be destroyed. And a mongrel race will dwell in Ashdod. And I will cut off the pride of the Philistines, and I will remove their blood from their mouth. In other words, the, these detestable practices and their detestable things from between their teeth. Interesting, Lynn. Then they will also be a remnant for our God. That is interesting. They will be a remnant for our God and be like a clan in Judah. And Ekron will be like a Jebusite. Now, that's a little, very interesting, little history. Who are the Jebusites? Well, they were the people that lived in the city of Jerusalem before it was Jerusalem. It was Jebus. And there was a people there. David, of course, conquered it, took it over. But the people that remained in the city just simply got enveloped into the nation of Israel. They just got rolled into the, the city and uh, eventually became Jewish uh, by faith. And uh, they just kind of enveloped in. And it's interesting that a few remain. And they just get enveloped in, just like the Jebusites. Just kind of interesting to me. Verse 8, I will camp around my house because of an enemy. Because of him who passes by and returns. And no oppressor will pass over them anymore, for I have seen with my eyes. Now, this is interesting. This is a reference to Alexander the Great. I will camp around my people for he who passes back and forth. Alexander passed several times back and forth, but never destroyed Israel, never attacked Jerusalem, not one time. Did Alexander the Great ever attack Jerusalem? Why not? Because the Lord had given him a vision. When he was in Macedonia, northern Greece, he had this dream. And in this dream, he saw a, a man in royal robes, in priestly robes. And it was in a particular garment of the priestly robe. And it was very distinct in his image. So as he's approaching Jerusalem, who should he appear to see? But a man wearing exactly the garment as he had in his vision. Now what had happened was <clears throat> the, the, the high priest of Jerusalem had his own dream. He felt that God was saying to him, approach Alexander on the road. You dress in your priestly garments, in the full array of your priestly garments, and bring the leading men of the city with you, and you go out and you meet him on the road. So he goes, does as the Lord, he believes, is directing him. He goes out onto the road, and so here comes Alexander the Great on his mighty horse. If you remember from history, he had an absolutely powerful horse, very famous, by probably one of the most famous horses of history. Uh, Bucephalus was the name of the horse, and it actually means the head of an ox because it was so powerful and strong. Absolutely a monster of a horse. And uh, he, he saw this horse when he was a teenager, and he asked his father for this horse. Uh, uh, a man was offering it to him, but no one could control the horse, and his father did not want that, that wild horse around. And so his father said, no, this horse is wild, and this horse is a monster. And he said, uh, if, I can, if I cannot tame him, I will pay out of my own treasury for that horse. So, fine, try to tame him. And to everyone's amazement, he did it. He calmed the horse. And so he would uh, have this relationship to this horse where the horse would only allow Alexander to ride it and would not allow Alexander to ride on any other horse. It was, and he would, now Alexander himself was a very tall of stature man. So when he's riding on this 
great horse and tall in stature. And then he had this uh, helmet with a great plume on it. He stood way out over everybody. He was like a statement of grandeur and power and majesty. So here comes Alexander the Great riding on his great Bucephalus horse in all of his you know, grandeur and power. And he sees a, pr- uh, a priest. And he's shocked because it's the same priest he saw in his vision. And so he gets off of his horse and he bows down on his knee. And the generals with him are, 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 are shocked. What is he doing? And he explains, he, gets, he explains to them, I saw this man. I saw this very man. He took this as a, a sign of God. He respected the God of Israel. Walked into Jerusalem with the priest, not riding his horse, walked into Jerusalem, through the priest, offered a sacrifice to Jehovah, and did not defeat or conquer Israel. Allowed them uh, freedoms of religion, that sort of thing. They paid a tax, they paid a tribute, but it was an interesting thing, and of course we spoke about this before, how that began the Hellenization or the Greek culture coming in, by which we now have our Greek New Testament. But all of this is interesting because it's a picture of something important that we're going to see. Because notice in verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. You might recognize this verse. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's like kind of the opposite of riding Bucephalus in there with all the grandeur and stature of a great mighty war horse. But you might recognize that verse. Does it come to mind? This is quoted in Matthew as a fulfillment of Jesus when he came into Jerusalem riding on the foal of a donkey that day that we call the great triumphant entry. That great triumphant entry of the Lord is marked to the day in the prophecy of Daniel. Behold, he says here in Zechariah, your king, your king is coming to you. There wasn't a king in Israel since the days that they were defeated by Babylon. Your king is coming to you. Rejoice, shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Your king is coming to you. He is just, which is to say he is righteous. He is covered with justice, and he is endowed with salvation. He is humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off. And he, who is the he? This is the coming king. He will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, this is just a foretaste. This is just a taste. Because what we're going to see in the next few chapters is a great detail added to this. Because what is he telling us? He's telling us that the king, Jesus, as we know now, will come into Jerusalem on that very day, appointed by the prophecies of Daniel, by the very day. He declared that from the declaration, a decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, to the coming of Messiah would be a specific number of years, according to sets of seven. And he described there would be seven weeks, and there would be 63 weeks. And he described the differences and how they come together. And there will be a final week yet put off. And so this is a really interesting thing because Jesus came into Jerusalem on the very day. You could take your uh, uh, prophecy abacus and calculate it exactly. And that was the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on the foal of a donkey. Absolutely amazing. <clears throat> and then what was the very first thing he did was to go into the Jerusalem, go into the temple, and cleanse the temple in great power, great authority. He's coming humble, mounted on a donkey. 
Why is he coming humble, mounted on a donkey? Because he's endowed with salvation, which is why they shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna, God saves. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He immediately entered into Jerusalem and confronted them harshly, strongly did he confront them for what they were doing. This is my father's house. This is my father's house. This is to be a house of prayer. And you have made it a den of robbers. Get out. I mean, that's kind of, well, that's kind of a strong thing to say, get out. That's, well, he didn't just say it. He took a whip and whipped them out. And he took the, 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 the money changers' temple and he threw them over. This is a very dramatic thing to do. I mean, like, don't do this at home because it's a very dramatic thing to do. And he overthrew them. And these are like heavy tables, not like these plastic tables. These are like heavy tables. And he just threw them over. And then all the, the, the doves and all the animals that were being exchanged, he chased them all out. Get out. The authority and the might. This is my father's house. But he's confronting them. Now, we're going to see that played out here in these chapters. It's all revealed in the Scripture. We go on. But verse 10 says, He will cut off the chariot and the horse and the bull of war because He's going to speak peace to the nations. So there will be a returning of the king. A return of the king by which He will speak peace to the nations. His dominion will be to the ends of the earth. He will have dominion over all the nations. Just a little taste, because there's more verses to come. And as for you, verse 11, because of the blood of my covenant, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Oh, that is very poetic. It's set in poetry. In case that your Bible doesn't outline it that way, this is set into poetry, like a song to be sung. And it's got very powerful verbiage and words. Now, as for you, I love the way he just turns his attention to them. Now, as for you, because of the blood of my covenant, I have set your prisoners free. It's a very beautiful picture for us. And you see, the blood of what covenant? The blood of what covenant? The blood of the old covenant, by the way, was only a picture of the blood of a greater covenant. And that was the covenant that was to come through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the covenant that he then reveals in Hebrews chapter 9. Would you all turn to Hebrews 9? I want you to see this <clears throat> because it really is interesting and amazing. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 11. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of bull of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order, listen to this now, in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must be necessity of the death of the one who made it. This is really interesting and amazing. You ever wonder, how is it that the old covenant people were saved? What blood exactly covered their sins? Was it the blood of bulls and goats? I don't think you're going to find a better verse in all of the Bible that answers that question than Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order. I have this highlighted in yellow and underlined. It's really important. 
in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. It was all based on the blood of Jesus that was to come. All of it looked forward. That's how amazing God's provision of Christ is on the cross. You're supposed to be going, wow, right now. Thank you, I appreciate the support. Now let's go back to Zechariah chapter 10. <clears throat> As for you, because of the blood of my covenant, I have set your prisoners free. I set them free from the waterless pit. Verse 12, return to the stronghold. That's a great, you know, in, in time of war, a fortress it would be where the, the soldiers would run to for retreat. So they would set up various fortresses uh, in the battle battle area. Return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have the hope. This is really a great verse. Do you have the hope? Return, return to the stronghold. For this very day I'm declaring to you, I will restore double to you. What a great promise. This very day I promise you. Write it down. I am declaring it to you. I will restore double to you. I just love the promises of the scriptures. All that the enemy has taken. All that the locusts have eaten. All that you have lost. All that's been destroyed. All that's been taken from you. All that's been robbed for you. All that the enemy has taken from you. I tell you now, I will restore it and I will restore double to you. It's an amazing statement to have faith. That's what they're supposed to do in response. Arise in faith, believe. Believe. <clears throat> For I'm going to bend Judah as my bow, and I'm going to fill that bow with Ephraim. And I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. That's interesting. And there is a, that is a, a, a part of a greater fulfillment. We know that, for example, the Maccabee revolt, if you know your history, that when Alexander the Great died... His territory was divided in the, under his four generals. And uh, the general that was over the, the part of Israel was a very despicable person. Just a despicable person and a tremendous picture of the Antichrist. And he had the audacity to offend the Jews by sacrificing a swine in the Holy of Holies. Just despicable. And Israel couldn't take it anymore. That is enough. That is enough. And they rose up. The Maccabee revolt, very famous. That they threw off the, the oppressor of Greece. A little picture of something. Yet it's a picture of something yet greater. I will stir them up. I will make you like a warrior sword. But see, what's the picture? Not by might, nor by power. By my spirit. He is the strength. He is the strength that we need to understand is our strength. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning, and the Lord God will blow the trumpet and will march in the south and the storm winds of the south, and the Lord of hosts will defend them, and they will devour and trample on sling stones. And they will drink and be boistered as with wine. And they will be filled like a sacrificial basin. And they will be drenched like the corners of the altar. Because of their victory. And the Lord their God will save them in that day. As the flock of his people. For they are like the stones of a crown. Sparkling in his land. Oh what comeliness, what beauty will be theirs. Grain will make the young men flourish, and the new wine the virgins. What a picture of blessing and prosperity that God's going to return to them, and they're going to be a great and victorious people because the Lord will be the warrior that fights for them. And we know that it's a picture of something yet far greater to come. For when the Lord does return, and we're going to see this in the chapters coming right away, that the Lord, when he returns, he will come as a victorious warrior and will defeat their enemies in the great battle of Armageddon, which takes place in the valley of Megiddo, just north of Jerusalem and somewhat west. And so there is this beautiful little picture for us 
that there is going to be something far greater revealed when the Lord comes and is their victor and their champion. Chapter 10. Ask rain from the Lord. Ask rain from the Lord at the time of the spring rain. The Lord, ask Him. The Lord who makes the storm clouds? Yes, but He will give them showers of rain and vegetation in the field to each man. Blessing. I'm going to bless this land. I'm going to return double portion on the rain. We all know living in Oregon, rain is a huge blessing. We love the rain in Oregon. That's how you know you're a true Oregonian. Because you love the rain. But can you imagine living in, in, a, in an area just dry and parched? I'm kind of like Southern California right now. The rain would be a huge blessing, a favor. They would love the rain. I mean, the rain would come down, and you can just imagine them st a farmer standing out in the fields going, rain, rain on me, soak, rain on me. This is a huge blessing. Rain on me, God. That's that picture. Ask rain. Ask rain from the Lord at the time of the spring rain. Spring rain is that which brings it to, right into the harvest. The Lord who makes the storm clouds, He will give them showers of rain and vegetation. Oh, we live in a place of abundance here. I think here in Oregon, in this particular area, is absolutely one of the best places in the world to live. Maybe I'm biased, but I think it's one of the most blessed people. It's, it's tremendously verdant with growing things and green trees and, and great weather and the rain, and it's just beautiful here. See, we, we sometimes take, take it for granted. You go to Israel and you take pictures and you're going to take a lot of pictures of rocks because it's just it's rocks and dry and it's brown and it's dirt and rocks and, and, and you come back with a lot of brown rocks in your pictures because that's the nature of the area. We get spoiled. We take it for granted. But man, if you lived in one of those areas, you'd realize this is huge. This is a great blessing. My, uh, my granddaughter and I went out yesterday, and um, we went pick strawberries. This, I was like, oh, this reminds me of the good old days. <laughs> when I used to pick berries. How many people pick berries when you were young? Wow. I mean, more than just a bucket or two. I mean, you actually pick berries, right? Like, wow. No wonder I like you people. Like, you know how to, you're blessed. And we're out there, you know, and just picking berries. And, and you know, we just wanted a, a few, you know, for a treat, you know, a dessert. And just the experience. And you just got to go, right? So, like, we got a bucket. Let's fill the bucket up, you know. And so it was just, just fun to see uh, her just enjoying the abundance that we have. It was really funny because then, because I'm picking. I used to pick berries. I was pretty fast. I'm picking berries and putting them in there, you know, and, and she's just, you know, picking and eating and picking and eating. And finally she says, can we switch buckets? <laughs> I want to look like I picked a lot. So, okay, so we switch buckets and I fill hers up. And, and then we went and made strawberries and ice cream. Like, you So ask for the blessing of the Lord, the spring rain. The, the Lord is going to bring the rain. But interesting, verse 2. For, because, and now he brings accusation against the leaders of Israel. For the teraphim, they speak iniquity. What are the teraphim? It's the plural of teraph, which means idols, these household idols. This was an infection of Israel. They had these teraphim on and on and on. Like, people, God is your Lord. What is this? What is this? The teraphim speak iniquity. Diviners, they see lying visions. They tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They're afflicted because there's no shepherd. So he's, he says, my anger is kindled against the shepherds. And I'm going to punish the male goats, meaning the leaders. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock the house of Judah, and I will make them like his majestic horse in battle. It's a picture, he says. They're like my sheep. I care for them. I love them. And so he holds it onto the leaders. See, this to me is really important. Uh, I, as a pastor, the word pastor 
really means shepherd. And I, I believe it's a huge responsibility to reflect the heart and the character of the Lord to his, she- to his sheep, to his people. And one of the things I'm convinced of is that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is his bride. He loves his bride. And therefore, pastor, pastors, you better love the bride because that is his bride and you're called to care for and to nurture and to edify and build up because that's his bride. And you better love on that bride because that belongs to Jesus Christ and that is his bride and you have the responsibility to feed those people on the word of God because that's the people that he loves and we are called to nurture them, to feed them. And I just love what he's saying here. He says, I hold it on those leaders because they did not feed my sheep. And we see this all over the scriptures. Would you look to Ezekiel chapter 34? Just turn to Ezekiel, just a few books to the left. Ezekiel 34. Because here we see the heart of the Lord here. It's very powerful. Notice what he says. Ezekiel 34. Verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against those shepherds. I'm going to demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding my sheep so the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore. Because he's angry with them. They're taking advantage of the sheep. And honestly, when I see some of these these people on TV that are just taking advantage, it it just gets you upset because you think, wait a minute, that is his church you're taking advantage of. I don't think God's going to take very kindly to you taking advantage of his church. But I shall deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, verse 11, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep, and I will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. And I will bring them out from the peoples, and I will gather them from the countries. Oh, there's a lot to this verse. I will bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in good pasture and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing ground and they will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. Beautiful picture. I will feed my flock. I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the scattered. I will bind up the broken. I will strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I'll destroy and I'll feed them with judgment. This is a powerful picture of the heart of the Lord. By the way, that's a great description right there of a pastor's job. Seek the lost. Bring back the scattered. Bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. Encourage and build up. Anyway, back to Zechariah chapter 10. And then... Verse 4, from them will come the cornerstone. Oh, this is filled with rich prophecy. Who's the cornerstone? Jesus is that cornerstone on which the whole building relies. From them will come the tent peg. What's a tent peg? That's the peg, that's the deeply strong peg that's laid into the ground and all the ropes that hold the tent are relying on its strength, the tent peg. From them will come the bow of battle. From them every ruler, all of them together. And they will be like mighty men, treading down the enemy in the mire of the streets in battle. And they will fight, for the Lord will be with them. And the riders on horses will be put to shame. And I'll strengthen the house of Judah. And I will save the house of Joseph. That's the northern tribes. And I will bring them back. I will bring them back. Because I have compassion on them. And they will be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God. And I will answer them. Ephraim, up in the north, will be like a mighty man. Their heart will be glad as if from wine. Indeed, their children will see it and be glad. Their heart will rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them together. It's like, you know, 
person, a soldier, you know, with a horse. He can whistle for his horse. The horse knows the exact whistle of the, of the soldier. I'm not doing that well, but you get the idea. And the horse picks up his ears. It's my master. And he comes charging back. There's that, that sense of picking up his ears. He hears the whistle. My master. And he returns. There's that beautiful picture. I will whistle for them. And I will gather them together. For I have redeemed them. This is just like Ezekiel 34. They will be as numerous as they were before when I scattered them among the peoples. They will remember me in far countries. Listen to this. And they with their children will live and will come back. They will live. They will come back. You know, never before in the history of the world, never before in the history of the world, has a people been dispersed among the nations and survived as a people? Never. It's never happened. You cannot bring one example in history. Yet it's happened to Israel more than once. Because each of them are a picture of something far yet greater. Because there will be one yet more. There will be one yet more. Here it gives a picture of this. They will live, and their children will hear it, and they will come back. When we get into chapter 11, I wish we had time. I had predicted that we would get through chapter 11 tonight. But when we get into chapter 11, we get some of the most amazing insights of what happened when Jesus himself came to Israel as that shepherd as the chosen one sent by God and what their response was to him as God's chosen shepherd. We know the response. We know the conflict that happened. But did you know that it's powerfully and beautifully portrayed in the scriptures? Which we're going to see. Their children will live and they will come back. I will bring them back from the land of Egypt. I'll gather them from Assyria. I'll bring them into the land of Gilead. What, what is that? Golan Heights. Lebanon, northern Israel, until no room can be found for them. Need more settlements. And he will pass through the sea of distress. And he will strike the waves of the sea. So that all the depths of the Nile will dry up. The pride of Assyria will be brought down. It's a picture of the nations. And the scepter of Egypt will depart, and I will strengthen them. I will strengthen them in the Lord. Listen to this. And in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. In his name they will walk. Now this is an important picture for us. In his name they will walk, which is to say what? They walk. They live. They, in him they live and move and have their being. In other words, there is a reality to the relationship. It would be kind of like this. Imagine that that uh, this is just an image, a picture, an analogy. Someone, uh, uh, you say to somebody, oh man, I would really love to get in shape. So someone says, oh great, here's a book. Here's a really good book on how to get in shape. And it teach, teaches you how to eat, teaches you how to exercise, all the regimen that you need to do. And you just read this book and it'll just show you the whole deal. And you think, great, thank you very much. And so you, you read the book and you think, that is really a fascinating book. I mean, it's just really interesting. I mean, it gives you all the information. And I've been studying, I've been memorizing that book. I mean, it's just a really good book. What can I say? It's filled with interesting stories of people who've done it and their testimonies, you know. And it's just, it just filled with interesting testimonies of people. And it's really inspiring. And I just love the book. I've memorized like half of it. I've been reading it like every day. And it is really an interesting book. You know where I'm going with this? Well, when's the day you're going to actually do it? When are you going to go and do something about it? When are you going to walk it? Isn't that the picture? He says, when are you going to walk it? I love this. I will strengthen them in the Lord. 
I will strengthen them, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. I will give you my spirit. I will infill you. I will build your faith. I will strengthen you. And in his name, they will walk. Walk. Do it. Build it. See it. Live it. Be it. Because he says, this is your Holy Spirit. This is my spirit. The presence of God is in you. What difference is it making? Is he igniting you with joy? Do you have peace? Is he filling you with grace? Do you have forgiveness? Do you have kindness? Are you blessing the underprivileged? Do you have his heart? Are you honoring his name? Are you living with that honor of God? Do it. Live it. Walk it. You'll be blessed. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. We honor you for not just giving us a book, but filling us with the power behind the book. That we might be a people who truly live it. Because you fill us with the very presence of the living God. And God, I pray that we would understand that you are our shepherd, our king, our valiant one the one who has redeemed us, the one who has borne our sins on the cross. And God, we honor you with our hearts of thanksgiving. And we want to walk it. We don't want to just read the book. We want to do it. We want to live it. We want to have the living faith that comes out of it because faith comes from hearing when it's moved by the Spirit. Church, tonight, would you say to the Lord, God, I don't want to just read this book. I don't want to just read this book. I want to live this book. I want to live this book. I want this to be in me, that I might live it in how I relate, how I speak, the words that come, the life I live, the honor of God, the joy of the Spirit, the peace of the Lord, the grace, the forgiveness, the kindness, the abundance of you, God. I want that. Just raise your hand and say that to the Lord. Would you do that, God? I want the abundance of you in my life the abundance of you in my life. Father, thank you for everyone. Revival is moving when your people are stirred. God, stir us, stir us, stir us tonight. Send your Holy Spirit and stir us up that we might truly be your people. We honor you, we love you, and we worship you tonight in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Can we give the Lord praise and glory and honor? Amen.